Welcome back, everybody, to Irish Illustrated Insider. It's Tuesday, July 12th. We have a two-man booth. Tim Priester here from Irish Illustrated. Pete Sampson from The Athletic. I guess, Pete, the, the, the biggest news since last Tuesday, uh, even more, even bigger than Nordane hiring a new baseball coach, which we'll get into that uh, further. And, and, no, and no real huge developments, I guess, one way or another with future conference alignment. But we'll talk on that as well. But Dante Moore... Uh, as expected on Friday, going into Friday, we anticipated that Dante Moore, the quarterback the Notre Dame thought, would be theirs long ago, uh, verbally committed to Oregon. Your perspective, uh, I mean, you were the guy that said long ago, beware of beware of Oregon, and uh, here we are. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are schools that are more most aggressive in NIL, you know, Tennessee, Oregon, Texas A&M, Florida, I think, you know, probably would put Texas in that group. I think Miami's Miami, probably yeah, in that Miami group is <laughs> For sure in that group too. And like when you're recruiting against those schools, you have to be wary of NIL and how much it matters to the prospect, how much it matters to the prospect's family. Um, you know, in these, in these recruitments, th those opinions can change throughout what was important in January, maybe different than what's important in July. So I think once Notre Dame took CJ Carr uh, smartly in June, I think that was that was kind of what you needed to know with the Dante Moore situation. Like Notre Dame was like, all right, we we need to get our quarterback now, yeah. even if it's a 2024 and you know reclassification is going to be a conversation forever. But um, yeah, losing Dante Moore, considering where they were in January, is a tough blow, you know. But if you're Michigan, this is a, the dad has a tattoo of Michigan on his shoulder and Michigan offered him, I think when he was 13 years old. So I think there are a lot of schools that felt like, all right, Dante Moore wants to play in the Midwest, wants to be closer to family. And then you end up at Oregon, like this recruitment changed a lot. Um, and you know, certainly NIL played a factor in it as Dante Moore himself said during his announcement. Right. Uh, double whammy for Michigan, Dante Moore. <clears throat> you know, who Michigan had hoped to get in and CJ Carr, the grandson of Lloyd Carr, they don't get him either. So uh double whammy for them, but um, yeah, I mean, Dante Moore uh, committing to Oregon. I, I find it, I find it a very unusual uh, landing spot geographically and uh, culturally, as I've said many times before, I have a, a older brother that's lived in Eugene, Oregon for 50 years and uh, the city of Detroit and Eugene, Oregon don't have a whole lot in common. So it'll be interesting. Uh, Dante Moore's adaptation to uh, a, a very different, I mean, seriously, a very different lifestyle, uh, ocean, mountains, um, and a lot of football, obviously, for Dante Moore as well. So Notre Dame has offered quarterback Austin Novosad, who has been verbally committed to Baylor since the middle of December. Uh, and so I think Notre Dame's caught his attention. Uh, so has Texas A and M. So has uh, who else, Pete? Um, Ohio State. Ohio involved. State. Of what, like, he visited Ohio State. Yeah, Ryan Day came. I think Ryan Day may have. I don't. I don't know if, what the visit was, but he's you know spent some time around Day. Both his both Novaseds' parents went to Texas A and M. Um, so there's a lot of family connections there. He was out at the Elite Eleven, performed very well. I think, I think every year, I mean, it's kind of like the draft cycle, right? Like every year there's a quarterback who you don't really hear a lot about and then makes this like rise up the boards, whether it be a draft board right. or recruiting rankings or just sort of interests. I think some of that is inventory schools that don't have quarterbacks want one. So they're figuring out who the best guy is. Um, pretty good chance Nova said is that. I don't, I don't know how much film you've watched of him, but I mean, he's, He's a tall guy that moves pretty well. Yeah, um, just a peak. I, I, I've just taken a peek. His numbers are really good last year. Yeah. 3,300 yards, 40 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Um, you know, pretty good fallback guy, so to speak, at, at this stage of the process. And, and you know, A&M and, &M and, and, uh, and ba of course, Baylor's still, you know, a possibility. I don't know about ultimately him ending up at Ohio State. But, uh, you know, we'll see. It, it's early in the process. Um. I understand why Notre Dame went the route that they did uh, in, in waiting out Dante more to the point of him making a decision before they, they made that offer. Um, but here we are. And so, and, and of course, behind all of this is the possibility that CJ Carr could 
reclassify and be in 2023. And then you turn the page and start looking at 20, 2024 guys. But um, anyway, uh, some, so the quarterback situation is as great as Notre Dame's class is the quarterback situation still is a sticking point for Notre Dame in the class of, of 2023 uh, conference alignment. I alluded to that at the top. I don't know that there's, Anything that's really changed in the last week? I was struck by the story, Pete, that you wrote for the Athletic about, you know, what would what would it mean Notre Dame being in the Big Ten? What would it mean schedule wise? Who would they be facing? I thought you made some interesting points with regard to the top of the conference, the elite. I just I didn't. I, I think somebody asked you in your mailbag, who who would you like to see Notre Dame play in the Big Ten? You said Iowa, Wisconsin. I, for me, it's Penn State, but that's because I was going to to Beaver Stadium, <laughs> you know, in the '80s, yeah. and 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 the rivalry really, really took off during that time. So for me, it's 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 Penn State. But anyway, if you could uh, just relate some of the things that you said regarding scheduling in the mid, compared to the ACC, upper echelon, middle of the pack. Big 10 versus ACC. That's yeah, because that's where I thought like the schedule. If you're like, what's a Big 10 schedule look like? It's uh, to me much more difficult for Notre Dame than what they play in the ACC. And it, it has less to do with like who's better Ohio state or Clemson or who's better Miami or Michigan um, or who's worse Illinois or Georgia tech. Um, right. But I think it's the middle of the big 10 where Notre Dame's schedule would get much, much harder when you're talking about Iowa, Michigan state, Wisconsin uh, versus what like Louisville, Pittsburgh, Wake Forest, Wake Pittsburgh. Forest. I mean, those are to me the, those are programs that are operating with completely different expectations. The Big Ten middle versus the ACC middle. So that's where it, when you start to put that down on paper, you're like okay, this this schedule to me is is someone who likes watching good college football games would be a lot more appealing. Um, I understand the the hesitation from Notre Dame fans about you know it's a little little too Midwest bias not in the South enough, all that's legitimate. Um, but just purely from a number of football games that in the summer you would look at and say like, Oh, that's a big game. Right. I feel like the big 10 offers you more of those. Yeah. I thought that was a good point because, you know, right now, upper echelon ACC besides Clemson, what is it? North Carolina that at six and seven last year, Yeah. actually, actually Pete upper echelon right now in ACC is NC state. Yeah. And Which that's is like, not yeah, moving the needle not, for anybody, right? No, that's not legit true upper echelon. So anyway, I thought that was stuff that stuff was very good. You made a reference to um uh Penn State and State College being impossible to get there. And and I and I it's and it is. I haven't gone there in the early 80s, uh, or in the in the mid to late 80s. Um, yeah, it, it is difficult to get to, but I thought it was kind of ironic that this past week, not only did I spend the night in state college, Pennsylvania. And yes, it was difficult to get to. I was on my way. We were on our way to another destination. Um, but I spent my birthday in state college, Pennsylvania. So, uh, I, I found a cat. I was saying, uh, don't tell anybody I was in state college when there wasn't a football game. <laughs> I'd love, I'd love for a Notre Dame home and home with Penn state again, because I don't like the Notre Dame game that I covered there. You've I'm sure been there multiple times. That was that like was the nine. That was the non-competitive 20, 2007 team, um, but the stadium was awesome. What the an press box shook. Um, it was just really, really difficult to get there. But if you're going there once every five years, I mean, I'd rather go to State College than Tallahassee. So how about that? Well, I think we're all in agreement with with that. And I, and I just, you know, I, going to State College en route to where we were going was out of the way, but we knew we were spent, spent the night, and I thought – you know what? It'd be kind of neat to just stay there when it's not frantic with a hundred thousand plus uh, people around the campus. And so drove by Beaver stadium uh, a couple days ago, a few days ago. And it's just kind of neat seeing it. It's changed. It's changed a lot. It's really changed. State college has really changed since, um, you know, many years ago when I was going there, the, the surrounding area has not changed. I want to, I want to ask you this, like if you're Notre Dame and you're joining the Big Ten, who would you want if you had two permanent rivals, not permanent rivals, but like if you played two teams every year and then rotated everybody else, it'd be USC and who else if you had to choose one? 
It would be it would be Michigan because the rival okay. rivalry is so great. Now I can remember many times going into a season, even with Lou Holtz as head coach, and Miami's or I'm sorry, Michigan is game one or game two. It's like, man, that's a that's a tough way to open the season. But wow. just because of the nature of the, the rivalry, it would be Michigan for me. I do like the idea of playing Iowa. I, the, Wisconsin doesn't. I mean, I, Wisconsin's physically tough and is would probably be a good game most of the, most of the time. But that that doesn't move the needle for me. Rivalry wise, the other one would be Penn State again, just because of my history and length in, in covering Notre Dame. Penn State and Michigan would would be the the two and those would be two two pretty pretty tough teams to have uh you know on a on a regular basis i didn't want to uh real quickly i know this segment one's going to last a little bit longer uh but i did want to mention the early enrollees uh at notre dame kevin sinclair our guy kevin sinclair i don't know if it, some people put out a list but our guy sent us a list last night and that and just to let everybody know the early enrollees in the class of 2023 running back Jaden Lamar wide receiver Braylon James wide receiver Rico Flores offensive tackle lineman Elijah Page offensive lineman Sam Pendleton defensive lineman Devin Houston linebacker Preston Zinter linebacker Drake Bowen Christian Gray the cornerback of Don Shuler the safety and another safety, Peyton Bowen. The, the, the guys that aren't expected to enroll early, Jagasaw, Odding, Absher, Flanagan, Keeley, Treor, who I'm really looking forward to seeing. Brennan Vernon, I think, is a fascinating guy because he was so highly rated when he committed, and then they brought in all these other defensive linemen, and they not a lot of attention is being paid to Brennan Vernon, but I think he's a really good football player. And then Micah Bell is expected to come in in June. I just wanted to... To throw that in and and end this segment with uh, the news that Notre Dame has found a baseball coach. His name is Sean Stifler. He's been at uh, Virginia Commonwealth for the last 10 years. He took Virginia Commonwealth to the NCAA tournament each of the last two years. And just as a point of reference, this past uh, June, they beat Georgia in the regional 8-1. to one. They beat North Carolina, a really hot North Carolina team, 4-3, to three, and then they had to just beat North Carolina once in the next two games and North Carolina bounced back and, and knocked them out. But uh, Stifler took VCU to the NCAA tournament in 2015. They won the Dallas regional, went to the super regional, lost two games to Miami. So he's an accomplished coach. He's 43 years old. I want to say former college pitcher from Somerset, Pennsylvania, uh, former twins draft choice who will be heading to Notre Dame. We'll have a press conference on Thursday and get to meet Sean Stifler at that time. Coming back, segment two, burning up the boards. Segment two of Irish Illustrated Insider is burning up the boards. And we start with a question from a wash ND directed to Pete Sampson. Pete, you essentially nailed Dante Moore's recruitment that if Oregon got involved with NIL, it would be a major red flag. Do you believe NIL and associated compensation was the driving force behind Dante Moore's commitment to Oregon. I think it was a factor for sure. Um, there's like we talked about in the first segment, there are schools with really aggressive NIL programs. Uh, Oregon's one of them. So, you know, when Dante Moore mentions NIL and sort of the ability for his family to get out to games. Yeah. It, it was a factor that doesn't mean it was the number one factor, but I think it became more important in my opinion. Uh, I think it became more important as his, recruitment played out over the summer. Um, and I think it's worth taking a step back and being, all right, NIL is all in year one. None of these players have gone through it. These collectives are really making things up on the fly. Um, some of the numbers are being thrown around, thrown around like the, the $8 million offer um, that, you know, we had a story on at the athletic is, you know, and players hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like if I was, a four-star prospect or five-star prospect, I would be like, all right, could, could I hear more about this? Um, could I, could we talk about the money that might change my family's life? I'm not saying that happened with Dante Moore, but um, I think that if you're a recruiting fan that you have to take that into account that this kind of stuff is happening and recruitments can change like crazy at the last minute because of it. You made a comment when we were talking off the record that, you know, there's kind of that attitude out there that anything associated with NIL is dirty. 
And yeah, it's not. I mean, that, you know, I, I think that that's unfair. I understand why some people look at it right. that way. But the comment that I made when, when I heard of USC and UCLA were going to the, the Big Ten, and when the elimination of all borders and conferences uh, w- was made, my first reaction was, you know what? I mean, in, how can you deny a player or a student athlete the opportunity to make as much as he can in NIL when university athletic directors and presidents are saying they really don't. I mean, if you're, if you, if USC is joining the big 10 and eliminating all the borders and the travel that's involved in, in trying to, to execute a, 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 a big 10 schedule, I mean, I, I, obviously the student athlete is not at the forefront of the minds of, of everybody in college football that's running it. So, Hey, go for it. I mean, I don't want to see guys being bought, but you certainly can understand why a student athlete, a potential student athlete wants to maximize his, his opportunity. And I think, I think Dante Moore and his family maximized the opportunity at Oregon. And I, I've asked Marcus Freeman about this before in interviews, just like when, if NIL, like what is the correlation between where NIL is a priority on a prospect's list and Notre Dame's likelihood of getting them. And he says, yeah, that's, you got to keep an eye out for that because Notre Dame's NIL program is much more, I think, sort of in the spirit of what we NIL Correct. was supposed to be. Right. Um, so if NIL is first on your list, you're less likely to end up at Notre Dame. That doesn't mean if it's on your list at all, you won't. But um, I think that's that. That's really. I hope that college football we get to a point where people just view NIL as like it's geography or the ability to win a championship or um you know what conference you're in or your ability to like prepare for the pros which is number one for a lot of guys like nil is just going to be like it's going to be a factor like that it's not in its own category it's just one of these factors and that and that's okay i don't know that people will view it that way though as long as there are outliers in the process oh yeah being an outlier texas a&m uh miami um yeah. So, I mean, people are going to look at that way and I get that. And I realize that there are varied opinions about which way it goes. And, and it, the reason it hits, I mean, it hits home because it's Notre Dame, because it, it, right. if this was a guy that had verbally committed to Michigan and then all this went down with him going to Oregon, Notre Dame fans wouldn't be so, you know, outraged by it. And I get that. And I, and I get, I completely get why, um, why some people view it as a dirty process and it'll, it will likely remain that way, but I don't think Notre Dame is approaching it that way. And that is right in line with the way the Notre Dame does business like it or not. Um, if you don't like that as a Notre Dame fan, do you like a top five class? Cause yeah. you like a top five class, the yeah. way Notre Dame's doing business is working out for you. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Question from uh, the Salty Jazz 14. What are your relatively optimistic expectations for Tobias Merriweather this year? Does 25 catches while flashing number one receiver potential sound correct? That would be a really, really good season for him. Um, And I wouldn't I would not rule it out. Uh, I think just for the sake of context, Michael Floyd's freshman season was 48 catches, 719 yards and seven touchdowns. That would be off the charts for Merriweather to approach that. Um, but 25 catches, 500 yards, four or five touchdowns. I think that would be a great, great freshman year for him. I, I'm glad you brought up Michael Floyd because I think, I mean, as I look at this right now, I think. Merriweather's freshman season falls somewhere between the 25 mark and what you're saying with, with Michael Floyd, Mm -hmm. they don't have a lot. I mean, they don't have a lot of, they don't have options with guys with size other than Deion Colsey, who still has a lot to prove. Jaden Thomas isn't quite that big, but is a bigger receiver and and will get his as well. Um, But I think it's somewhere in between there. And I don't think those expectations are unrealistic. Typically, with a freshman, when you start getting beyond, you know, 17, 18, 25 catches, that's generally speaking, an unrealistic expectation. I don't think that that's an unrealistic expectation. How about, how about this stat line? 18 catches, 312 yards and three touchdowns. That was the freshman year of Maurice Stovall. 
I, I mean, I think under normal circumstances, that would be good, but they need more. Yeah. I mean, I they, agree. Just, they, they just need more from him. They know that he knows that now. And again, uh, all signs, I don't know that a day goes by where I don't get positive feedback about Tobias Merriweather one way or another. That, and that says a lot of, that says an awful lot about him, so, which leads us into our next question, which is from judge Arthur Vandalay, who has more receptions this year, Dion Colsey, Jaden Thomas, or Tobias Merriweather. Mm, I, I guess if I had to rank them in order, I would go Thomas Merriweather Colsey. That, I think that's what I would do. I think Thomas and Merriweather end up being very close to one another. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they, they Jane Thomas has to play. He does have size. He has strength. That was something that Chancey Stuckey talked about was, you know, he's, he's accustomed coming from high school. He was accustomed to just physically beating people, you know, with his strength, but he has to realize that he, you know, just kind of what athleticism he has and how quick that he can be. So he's learning to become a combination of the two, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I think Thomas and Merriweather end up, being close and until Colsey starts making a move. Uh, I think as we look at those guys, he, he, right now, he looks like a distant third, um, you know, to those other two guys question from Irish from a two, what does success look like for Notre Dame's offense in 2022, given the limited depth at receiver and injuries at running back, what is the best case scenario for this offense? It's it's a hard question to answer because it's like I don't know if Irish from A2 wants like a scoring average or um you know a third down conversion rate or or what or what, but I would say better on third down, run the ball in the red zone, and you know, maybe I don't know what Ohio State's gonna look like because it's the first game for so many people, but you know, by Clemson and USC to play play really good football. And that might mean winning that game, those games, 28, 24, it doesn't need to be 45, 31. Um, just the ability to, to deliver in situational moments, um, which I think they've been pretty good at over the last couple of years. Uh, so to be able to sort of carry that on, I, yeah, but I, in terms of a stat, I don't, I'm not sure if I have yeah, a really good one. Yeah. I, I, I had the same uh, dilemma. I mean, again, we could throw a number out there, but I'm not sure really what that really means. I do think there are a couple factors to take into consideration. One, I think we both expect Notre Dame's defense to be very good. And so that yeah. can alter the way that Tommy Reese approaches the offense. Number two, I think I said this last week as I was finishing up a first rate story on defensive lines, Notre Dame and their 12 opponents there aren't a lot of real quality defensive lines on Notre Dame's schedule. So when you match up Notre Dame's offensive line and its potential against some of those D lines, um, you know, I like Notre Dame's chance in particular to, to run the football against them. So again, that dictates what quote success means. Um, Notre Dame's offensive line is, is, is a strength for them or a projected strength. And then I agree with you, um, you know, red zone. I mean, I, I think that they can have success with the, in the red zone, which frequently dictates just exactly how much, how many points you average, um, you know, the difference between a, a team averaging 31 points a game and team averaging 36 points a game generally comes down to your red zone percentage. Are you successful? Right. You know? Uh, and so I think there are a lot of factors there. And then, what do opponents do to Michael Mayer? Are they going to overplay him to the extent that you, you know, now your whiteouts have to be successful. That's why it's a good thing with the, the, the positive things we're hearing about Tobias Merriweather. So I think there are a lot of factors in here, but the first ones I want to point out is that I don't think that there are a lot of real quality defensive lines that Notre Dame will be facing this year. And that, um, that, that could really be in Notre Dame's favor offensively. Question from Irish 1490, rank the road game trips for the 2022 season. And this was actually fairly easy to do. I don't know yeah. if you felt that way as you were putting it together. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, generally speaking, I think that is the case. And then the second question, who I unfortunately, as I usually do when I pair these up, I left the person's name out of it. But what has been the best travel to an ACC town in your experiences? All right, the road games this year won 
I guess we can have a debate on what makes a good road game, but I'm going to put BYU as number one and Ohio State as number two. I think for obvious reasons, um, the uh, uh, weekend in Las Vegas is going to beat out or nudge out the Ohio State experience <laughs> in Columbus. As Ohio State, shockingly, is going to honor its 2002 national championship game that weekend or team that weekend. Uh, after that, USC is number three easily. Uh, beyond that, I went North Carolina at four, Navy at it's- five, and then a distant, distant last Syracuse in late Syracuse. October. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I fight. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, like trip for us or trip for, you know, Notre Dame football. I, 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 I get both at Ohio state, which is, um, a very, very unique experience. Having been there, having been there, Jesus is approaching 30 years now. So it's been that long. Uh, but I have, I don't know about you. I'm probably one of the few, <laughs> I mean, I've been all over the country covering Notre Dame. The only time I have been in Las Vegas was a connecting flight. So (laughs) I literally, I literally have not been on Vegas ground in, in my life. So uh, probably go out a little bit early. I think you should for that game. Uh, Not probably. I don't think two days early. It's coming off a bye week I mean, might as well go out a whole. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, I'm going to be making it. See, I'm going to be making a trip to New Jersey during the bye week. So, uh, just <laughs> not ideal. But anyway, Vegas. those two, flights. Yeah, those two games are great, and it's always it's always fantastic. November 26. Where would you like to be? Southern California. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, at Syracuse, I've been there. I I'll let you guys go to that game. Um, <laughs> and then Navy, even make your list then. Yeah, uh, yeah, Navy. Yeah, well, my 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 uh, travel schedule has altered th- this late in my career. But Navy and Baltimore, don't think that's happening for me. Uh, the the trip to Chapel Hill, I think, is always is always fun. Uh, but what is your best ACC town that you've been been to? I, you know, I. It's a bit of a reach just because it got rained out the whole time, but like I really like the vibe around Clemson. I just never got to be around Clemson because it was pouring rain the whole time. Um, you know, I think other ones I and I I like our trips to Pittsburgh. Uh, that's not really an ACC town, um, yeah. but I enjoy that trip. And then I mean, I, I enjoy the Boston College games too. Um, but again, that's more to do with Boston. I wouldn't describe Boston as an ACC town necessarily. Yeah, I wouldn't either, and I agree with you with Clemson. When you were st- when you were starting to talk about the weather, I thought you were talking about NC State, the no, NC State no. trip, <laughs> which you want to talk about really not being able to enjoy the environment. It was uh, Hurricane. What 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 hurricane was that? Hurricane Matthew, Kelly. I think it. Yeah, was it Kelly? yeah. I think it was. <laughs> I think it was Hurricane. Uh, Matthew. Yeah. You know, Virginia Tech was a, 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 oh, pretty, yeah. a really, yeah. really cool night environment. Uh, I've always enjoyed going to Boston because it's Boston, but uh, I just like a lot of the AC, like the NC state, Wake Forest, Duke, North Carolina, sort of are all the same trip. Yeah. I agree with you there. I agree with you there. Yeah, I enjoy them, um, yeah. but it's all, this, it all feels the same. Yeah. All right. We're going to throw in a recruiting question here from B54, does Notre Dame land Hannafin, Love, and Osbury, in your opinion? Hannafin, yes. Osbury, yes. Uh, Love, I think, is a little bit of a harder read. Um, I know Notre Dame sort of likes where they stand with him. I think he's a really, really dynamic player. He's Um, a really good player. So I'll go with yes on all three, um, but I feel way more confident about Hannafin and Osbury. I, I agree with you there, but if we have to say yes or no, I would say yes to all of them. But I, I mean, and if I had to rank them in order of confidence, I think I'd go Hannafin, uh, Hannafin first, Osbury second, and then, and then love third. <clears throat> Jumping back uh, to a question from Mr. Irish red, what positions do you think it is important for a, a football player to enroll in January? Or is this process as individual as the situation is for the player? It's an interesting question. I think you you mentioned this to with we did Marcus mention Freeman. Marcus Freeman, um, yeah. And I I mean I read his comments and I pretty much agree with it. It's like quarterback always always important. 
Um, whether you play or not it is, is vital that you do it. Um, but I think Freeman's point, and I agree with this, like, did Michael Mayer or Kyle Hamilton need to enroll early? Right. No, but I mean, guys, if, but, 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 you know, those guys are freaks too. So that, I yeah. don't know that it's fair to use them as a comparison. Right. Um, but it's just like, if you're an elite player, you're an elite player, whether you show up in January or you show up in June. Um, but I would say like the positions of most important, it's like quarterback is one. And honestly, I think there's a huge gap after that. Um, I would probably go kind of corner receiver just because I think all the, like, especially the strength positions, the point of early enrollment to me, at least is like, you're in the weight room, you're working out, you're getting bigger, but you know, Blake Fisher would be the counter example to that. Right. Like, but again, maybe yeah, he's that, in the freak category and it wouldn't yeah, have mattered when he, he showed up. No, I, I agree with that. I would, I would throw offensive line in there just because technique and yeah. the strength that you, you know, I mean, there's so many details that you can imagine of, of, I mean, of the positions going from high school to college, the jump from offensive line and high school to college has to be hugely significant because it's, it's five guys working together, which makes it that much more difficult to accomplish. So I would agree with the quarterback wide receiver, just because, you know, like, for example, we're hearing about uh, Tobias Merriweather as, you know, a guy that understands route concepts. Well, you know, and I wonder if that's learned or if that, a lot of that is just instinct. And, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't know, but when you hear about how quickly he's adapted to, to route concepts, you got to believe that, that coming in early uh, for a wide receiver would, would certainly help, but I would include offensive line in there too, just because I think there's so much involved in there. And, and to a large extent, tying in with wide, wide receiver and, and route concepts, would be DB's corner in particular. It's safety too, though, because you don't, those guys are playing one or two coverages in high school. And now it's the most complex thing that they've ever seen in their life. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to wrap up with a question from BWAC29. As we get closer to actual football, rather than just recruiting, it seems like the vibe towards the Ohio State game has started to shift to a quote Notre Dame has no shot at winning this game stance on the podcast. What would you need to hear during fall camp to shift thinking that Notre Dame has a good chance of beating Ohio State on September third? Have we been um, have we yeah. been saying that? I mean, I they are. The, I'm, I misread the question as 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 if the vibe was turning more positive towards Notre Dame's uh, chances on the podcast, not the other way around. I are you reading it the way I am then now? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. that that we're moving away from Notre Dame having a chance to win the game, which. It, it is a, uh, a time out our tradition that when training camp starts, we tell ourselves that we're not going to talk ourselves into changing our opinion about the season based on the things and the vibes that we're hearing. And then inevitably we do uh, because it, things seem very positive in the preseason. Um, I, I would think if you said, okay, what is it going to take for Notre Dame for me to believe Notre Dame has a, a chance to like a, not like a crazy upset chance, like go toe to toe and win the game. I think, you know, we get back to Tobias Merriweather, which you talked about a bunch, like he would have to be lighting it up in camp. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think Riley Mills would have to be a dominant player out of the gate. Um, that goes, with, it goes without saying Tyler Buckner. This goes back to the, uh, I think it was Irish and a two about the offense. Like, what do you want to see? You want to see Tyler Buckner have command of the offense. That's, so statistically i don't know how you quantify it but that's what you want to see yeah. so i mean i would say those three things there was i think someone put a question out on twitter about like if you could pick three all americans from this team a one first one second one third that would maximize how good notre dame was this year who would you choose and o'malley and i were talking about it and i said buckner one merriweather two mills three not because i don't think foskey and mayor are great but we already know how good they are but if you had an all-American first team all-American quarterback and your freshman was a second team all-American receiver, that means you have a A number one player. And then Mills rounding out your defensive line, you have a dominant defensive line. So it's, I mean, those are to me, those are the three guys that are kind of like the Delta players for Notre Dame. Like they can take where Notre Dame is now 
and really push it forward. So those those would be the three guys I would I would want yeah. to call out. You know, I I like your pick of Mills there, and you mentioned him in a, in a previous podcast, and I agree with that. Leah Fowl, who we have great yeah expectations for, if he's playing at the level that we expect him to be able to play, I think that takes them to another level. I'd throw out Josh Lug because the expectations for Josh mm. Lug among Notre Dame fans seems to be so low. A, a six year senior, a twenty four year old football player i think if josh lug plays up to his capabilities now you're really tying that offensive line together and then you can talk about you know clarence lewis if clarence lewis could take the next step and if he doesn't can Jaden mickey take the next step you mentioned tyler buckner i think that goes without yeah it goes without saying but let me just i mean is anybody that that reads irish illustrator reads our work and hears uh, our podcast with you pete i mean we're we're not homers. I mean, we're, we're realistic about, we're realistic about going to Ohio state where, by the way, in the last 67 games, they've won 63 times. And Notre Dame's a 14 point underdog with a new quarterback and a new head coach. And I mean, I don't think that we're being overly pessimistic. I think we're just trying to look at things in very real terms as to what, what could happen there. I expect Notre Dame I expect Notre Dame to certainly compete and be in the game the whole way. And I, and I'll go back to something that I said earlier in the summer, and I'm not sure that I believe it as much now as I go through the first rate stuff and watch people and watch Ohio state. But I think Notre Dame has an advantage. How big an advantage remains to be seen, but I think Notre Dame has an advantage on the offensive and defensive line against Ohio state. It may be small, um, but it may be a little bit bigger than the odds makers at 14 points per game actually realize at this point. So, yeah, so I mean, it's the whole, how does Notre Dame condense the game? That's, that's basically going to be the story from now until kickoff. It's like, how do you shorten, take a game where one team has more explosive athletes on the outside than you and like negate that. It's tough. It's tough to do that for four quarters. There's, there's no doubt. And, and I, and I think that there are only a handful of teams that can beat Notre Dame this year. I mean, I, 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 and I, and Ohio state certainly is one of them, but you're right. It's going to have to be there. There will be time. My point is there will be times where Notre Dame is going to have to condense the game just because the nature of their offensive personnel at wide receiver, the running backs they've lost and an experienced quarterback, they're going to have to approach those games probably a lot differently than they do against Boston college and Marshall and Navy and North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but I do think it starts with, it starts with Buckner. I mean, I don't know that there will be anything in the preseason that we see that would change our mind more than Tyler Buckner looking really good when we have access to open practices that would that would be a big one i mean it's it's the biggest one i would agree and we are going to wrap up this week's edition of irish illustrated insider we are going to i don't believe we have taken a week off in 2022 we are going to do that next next week as we get a little bit closer to uh the opening of camp what's the date on that pete august 5th is that correct it's yeah a friday i believe it is august 5th if i can get my calendar to move i can tell you but yeah it's whatever that that first friday in august is the beginning of camp uh and then it will be sort of on from there like then it'll be multiple podcasts a week there will be multiple podcasts a week through august we may start that the last week of july but our next podcast will be uh, we're anticipating we've had difficulty hitting this Monday, but I think we'll be able to hit Monday, July 25th. Uh, if everything stays in order with our schedules for our next podcast, as always, as I always say, we do appreciate our listeners here on Irish Illustrated Insider. And uh, we expect Tim O'Malley to be back when we uh, convene once again on Monday, July 25th. This has been Irish Illustrated Insider. Thank you for listening to the Irish Illustrated Insider Podcast. If you enjoy our coverage of Notre Dame football, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. Go to irishillustrated.com slash support. Your support will help Irish Illustrated continue to be the leader in coverage of Notre Dame athletics.